I'm here today in our Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies to invite you to come with me on a journey. My name is Helen Berry and I'm a Professor of History and I'm also the Deputy Pro Vice Chancellor in the Faculty of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences here at the University of Exeter. Our new exhibition, Challenging Legacies, is all about the life and the contribution to the history of the Middle East by a figure who is not very well known to many of you, but I think you're going to find this interesting. Her name is Gertrude Bell. Gertrude Bell was a daughter of privilege, born in 1868 to a northeast industrial family. She could have lived a life of ease and comfort, but instead she, from a young age, had a great curiosity about learning. She was one of the first women to go to Oxford University. She wasn't allowed to be awarded her degree, but she, in two years, earned herself a first-class degree in modern history. She then decided to go traveling. She was a keen adventurer, a linguist, and wanted to travel more. She soon got the bug. She went to stay with family friends who were diplomats and started to become curious about the Middle East. She learned fluent Arabic and became deeply immersed in the literature and culture of the Arab peoples. She started to write her own translations and eventually had an aspiration to be an author and publisher in her own right. She became interested in photography and as she started to go on her own expeditions in the Arabian Peninsula, she started to document and photograph a whole range of the peoples that she met there. She started to photograph people who were Bedouin, people who travelled around constantly and who had never been photographed before. She captured the lives and cultures of people like the Yazidi, who had been often invisible to the Western gaze. Through her status as a woman, she was given privileged access behind closed doors to the women of harems, enclosed women who had never previously been photographed. Gertrude Bell's archive is at the University of Newcastle. They hosted an exhibition recently and we've invited them to bring that material here and colleagues and students have responded to the material and given fresh insights into Gertrude Bell's interactions with the Kurdish people and that's enabled new interpretations and perspectives on the archaeological evidence and indeed the photographs, diaries and letters which are here in the exhibition. To get a deeper insight into the Kurdish perspective on the Gertrude Bell archive, I'm here talking to my colleague, Dr. Ferengis Kadri, about the material. So she's uh, considered and talked about as a person who um, uh, severely um, uh, opposed the idea of the independence of southern Kurdistan. Um, and she was very influential in um, the, the forcible annexation of southern Kurdistan to the state of Iraq. The Kurds uh, resisted and there were many uprising, many revolts in Kurdistan. It was a forcible and very violent annexation, uh, integration to the state of Iraq, which continued throughout the 20th century. Uh, just at the start, um, it was largely um, uh, with the help of the Royal Air Forces, the RAF, that the British um, managed to um, uh, control the Kurdish, the Kurdish regions. Um, and Gertrude Bell is not shy about talking about, as she called, the wonders of RAF in a very difficult um, uh, territory. But also, the newly founded Iraqi army was used to suppress uh, the Kurdish uprising. And it's very interesting to remember that the, the Iraqi army, most of the operation uh, throughout the 20th century was against Kurdistan. So this was a long, violent and bloody um, engagement. And maybe that hasn't been sufficiently written about in the past because there's mm -hmm. been a narrative about the creation of modern Iraq and nation building. Absolutely, absolutely. The, the narrative 
has largely, on Iraq, has largely ignored the experience of the Kurds and their experience, the sacrifices and the, the cost to the Kurdish people in the process of this, uh, the creation of the state of Iraq and also its development. I wanted to uh, highlight some of the Kurdish newspapers as, um, as a reflection of what they were trying to um, tell the world, what, what are their aspirations. Um, and if you, when you look at this, you see that they present a very different outlook. They did not want to be part of Iraq. They, they presented themselves as a separate nation with a different, distinct language, culture and history. And they wanted an independent state. And also, we need to remember that uh, the inconsistency of the British um, uh, policies toward the Kurds. They were first promised um, in, they, the British actually encouraged the Kurdish, Kurdish nationalism after the World War I War, uh, and um, they promised support, they would support the, the creation of an independent Kurdistan. Uh, this was clearly stated in uh, the first paper, the first newspaper that the British published in 1918. The title of the paper was Tegesh Nirasti, Understanding the Truth. And the subtitle was, this is a social and political paper that supports the unity and independence of Kurds. So this was a clear message from the British to the Kurds. And they believed that. So they invited, the, they, they, they asked for protection of the British uh, while they uh, set up a, an administration by Sheikh Mahmoud Barzanji. But less than a year later, Sheikh Mahmoud, the Kurdish leader, uh, realized that what British wanted as Kurdistan, the geography, the territory, was significantly smaller than what they had promised in Tegesh Nirasti and the correspondences. So uh, there, there was a revolt. He revolted, uh, there was a rebellion, and British, um, he was injured, he was captured and sent to exile. And then there was a direct rule for one year and again, after much pressure from the Kurds, they had to bring back Sheikh Mahmoud from India. And again, after one year, conflicts arose. Um, and again, there was another, another uh, on the ground partisan uh, war. This time, Sheikh Mahmoud didn't surrender. He went, uh, he went to um, uh, the nearby mountains and took refuge in a cave. And from that cave, he published a paper. It's very interesting that he took the printing press that the British had brought with them, he took that and published a Kurdish paper, which was called Bangi Haq, The Call for Justice. And the subtitle of this paper was, Cannons and Bombs Will Not Defeat the Call for Justice. So it's quite clear what, what the agenda was. They returned after um, uh, defeating the British forces on the ground. They returned to the city of Soleimania once again, set up the third Kurdish government. And this time it was as a result of the RAF uh, heavy bombardment of the city, they finally surrendered. What I like to highlight in this exhibition was how the British and the Kurds used um, um, printing culture in, in, to advance the, the agenda, to advance the ideas and ideals. Now, all of this we might regard as slightly problematic today. She, of course, was a white Western woman armed with her own education, her own biases and perspectives. One of the most problematic things about Gertrude Bell from a modern perspective is that she was an unashamed imperialist. She saw herself as part of the British imperial project in what was then known as Mesopotamia. Very quickly, the British government realised it would be an advantage to employ her and to use her skills, her knowledge and her extensive travels to gain them access to the peoples and cultures who were of prime political interest at a time when the Ottoman Empire was collapsing just before the First World War. Gertrude Bell was the only woman on the payroll of the Cairo office at the time when the famous T.E. Lawrence, better known to us as Lawrence of Arabia, was very much part of the inner circle of British diplomats at that time, who planned a future, what would happen in the Middle East after the First World War. 
So to learn more about the history of the Ottoman peoples, I'm going to talk to Dr. Semi Celik, who's a historian here at the University of Exeter, specialising in this field. So it's really good to be talking to you, Semi, and you are one of the experts on the pre-World War I Ottoman Empire. So I'm really interested in what you have to say about the Gertrude Bell material. Can you start by telling us a little bit about the expertise that you're bringing to this? What, what are you an expert on? So my larger interests in the Ottoman history uh, comprises of environmental history, history of climate, history of science, which from a distance might sound a little bit unrelated, but on the other hand, I'm actually also interested in archeology, span history of archeology, span and how actually techniques and science of archeology span um, has been embedded in politics of imperial Ottoman uh, world and how the Ottomans kind of perceived the foreign uh, archaeologists uh, who were digging, who were working or doing uh, field work in their territories across the 19th century, especially into the uh, 20th century um, towards the, uh, the First World War. Um, so Bell, Gertrude Bell is quite a central figure within this history for me. Well, I'm dying to ask really, do you think Gertrude Bell was a good archaeologist? Looking at the sources, uh, to be honest, um, I would be able to tell you that the Ottomans thought uh, so that uh, that Bell was an important person, an important individual, um, not only traveling across you know, the Ottoman territories, but also uh, photographing, investigating ancient sites. And also at some point when she was involved uh, in, um, in Konya, in the Bimbir Kilise, or the, the English version is uh, 1001 churches, um, she has been thought of as actually a proper archaeologist who were digging, who was excavating, as well as, well as uh, photographing uh, ancient sites. So Semi, the exhibition is called Challenging Legacies. And can you give us some perspective on what the Ottomans thought about Gertrude Bell? Yeah, so um, the Ottoman perspective is all, all, often always missing in the picture. That's why I think adding this perspective to this exhibition was quite important. Gertrude Bell, in her letters, in her diaries, gives a lot of information about what she saw, uh, but also she gives a lot of information about who she has met on her way. And a lot of these names that we encounter in her uh, diaries or in her letters are actually Ottoman um, imperial agents, be them local governors, be them uh, local administrators, or even central um, administrators or, um, let's say, uh, bureaucrats who are higher up in the bureaucratic uh, scale uh, and hierarchy. Um, so from that, we understand that she was in constant touch with uh, the Ottoman authorities during her travels across the Ottoman uh, Empire. So when we look at documents, when we look at archival material from the Ottoman archives, imperial archives in Istanbul, uh, one of the first characters we see um, there uh, as Bell is this kind of woman who travels to places which have been considered as wild and you know, impossible to travel in even as men. So, so were they really curious about her? I mean, she was such an unusual figure. You didn't yeah. have British women going off on their own doing this. Did they comment on that? Were they um, suspicious of her? Or? So the picture that the Ottomans uh, depicted around Bell's identity was not, uh, let's say, uh, homogeneous. It wasn't just one Bell. There were multiplicity. There were more than one Bells in the documentation, in the correspondence that we find in uh, Ottoman Imperial Archives in Istanbul. Um, so first of all, she was a traveler, but she was also considered as an expert in archaeology, in antiquities. Uh, she was taking photos. So she was this figure coming from the UK, from, from Britain, um, this woman who goes you know, to weird places, weirdest of places of all. Um, so she needed to be protected. And are they asking questions like, why is she going there? Is um, she a spy? What is she doing? Yeah, they try to make sense of it. They're not op openly asking these kind of questions, mm. but you can see the implicit idea. What, why is she doing this? Because, you know, it's also troubling the imperial authorities as well. We need to protect her. She shouldn't be going there, but, you know, alas, she's going. Um, but then there's another side to her, which the Ottomans uh, consider quite positively, and they actually encourage and they, let's say, mo uh, they help her. Um, to kind of, uh, let's say, take this side of her out, which is the archaeologist's spell. Um, and she, as I was saying, uh, she goes to all these ancient sites in Asia Minor, and also in Mesopotamia, taking photos and also getting involved with uh, fieldwork and also ex ex excavation activities. And especially the letters that, or the kind of the permission letters that she receives, talk about this site quite a lot, emphasizing that this is an exceptional work, that, you know, um, that we should give her permission to be in these sites, travel across the, the country um, and take photos and also do field work. 
Some of the material that we are including in the exhibition hints at the fact that some of the Ottoman civil servants thought that she might be dangerous. Yeah, so, um, so among this, you know, layers of layers of characters that the Ottomans tried to kind of identify uh, Belle with, um, the, the, the identity, the character of spy or being an imperial agent of the British Empire uh, was the third layer which becomes much more stronger as time goes on and uh, into the First World War. Um, so we see that it is also complicated that it's not on, she's, she's not considered as a spy merely, but um, that she's been considered as an individual with political opinions. So when she published her first book about Syria, uh, The Desert and the Song, uh, after the Ottomans have seen that work and they have read it, they thought, okay, this is you know, someone, an individual, with political opinion, which might be dangerous for the empire. So actually, among the documentation that I found, among the correspondence that I found in the archives, they actually talk about, you know, these are dangerous ideas, we should actually stop her from traveling in 1909. Mm -hmm. um, but then, for some reason, they don't. They decide that this is fine. Probably the reason is that this is an individual, and these are individual political ideas, which might be harmful, but not necessarily. Mm -hmm. But then, uh, into the 1910s, and as the you know, war starts breaking in 1914, um, then we see that actually they recognize that she has um, almost an organic uh, tie with the, the um, British intelligence establishment, and the War Office employs mm -hmm. well, actually, during the First World War, so they decided that okay, this woman is individually dangerous, so she should be stopped. Even though that is the case, we don't see this kind of discourse. The language is not that, you know, she's dangerous, we have to stop her. There's no kind of, um, let's say, um, abrupt, you know, language that aims to stop all stop her activities. Her. Yeah. Um, but the, the language is, again, kind of negotiating this identity that, you know, she has dangerous ideas, she's, she might be a dangerous person, we should do something about her. Gertrude Bell's legacy, therefore, is highly controversial. We might admire her adventures, we might admire her scholarship. Her photographic legacy is considerable in relation to the archaeological sites and the peoples who she photographed. But she also left a controversial legacy uh, of imperialism and what we would now call post-colonial critics would view her legacy as something not necessarily to be celebrated, but to be questioned. I really hope you have the opportunity to engage with Gertrude Bell for all her complexity and controversy. The exhibition contains fascinating and stimulating material that I hope will open up fresh debates about her legacy in the Middle East. You can also find the full collection of the Gertrude Bell archive online through the University of Newcastle. And if you follow the link at the end of this presentation, it'll give you access to the Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies collections and further information about the exhibition. Thanks for watching. <laughs>